Welcome to Cafe 229. My name is Joanne Chen. Today we have uh, Dr. Michael Burke from St. Joseph College. He's a, a philosophy professor. Welcome, Dr. Burke. Thank you so much, Joanne. Thank you for having me. And uh, I'd like to thank the Shuji organization as well. Um, uh, I uh, have had some affiliation with the Shuji organization in the past. I went with uh, Dr. Lin on a trip to uh, Taiwan with 20 students from St. Joseph's College and it was quite the adventure. And uh, thank Great. you for having me here. Wonderful, must be and such an adventure for you to travel overseas yes. and uh, to lead like 20 plus students uh, as a college kid. It was, you know, it was my first time in Asia and I think it was the first time for many, almost all the students, you know, it was their first time in Asia. And for some students, we had at least a few students who actually had never travel out of the country, uh, one or two had never been on an airplane before. So there was a lot of, you know, uh, um, I, don't, I don't want to say growing pains, but there was a lot of really interesting challenges. And I think the students in general did well, and we certainly appreciated the hospitality mm. that Shiji University offered us. Thank you. Must be an eye-opening experience for most of the students. I think it was. I definitely think it was. <laughs> and I heard your courses are the most interesting ones for them. And uh, it's so, such a great opportunity to have you today. And uh, I'm at such an amateur in philosophy. And uh, so I, I, I saw that you have a trolley cars in a time of pandemics today to share with us. All right. So this is basically um, a sort of lecture that I sometimes, uh, I usually give in my first day in my ethics courses. So the idea is, you know, um, it, you know, most of the students, you know, uh, are, are, have never taken a philosophy course before. Mm -hmm. And so they don't know really what, what is involved in ethics. And so what I'd like to do is I introduce some really basic ideas that we're going to explore of the course of the semester. Mm -hmm. So we look at moral dilemmas and we look at uh, this idea of thought experiments. And the thought experiments are ways that we sort of present these moral dilemmas. And it's a way for students to start to um, flex their moral imagination and mm -hmm. start to think about different ways of uh, making sense of their moral intuitions and seeing whether or not they um, can be defended or whether they have to be jettisoned at the end. And so we go through a series of different um, moral dilemmas. They're sometimes organized under a field called trolleyology, and I'll explain a little more, more what that means. Uh -huh. But, you know, especially I was thinking about this topic for uh, this talk, and I thought, you know, there's so many trolley car or trolleyology experiments right now that are actually happening li live mm -hmm. during our time, during this global struggle with COVID-19. And Definitely. I thought that might be a helpful topic to discuss and to think about ways that, you know, we can make clear our own moral intuitions and presuppositions as we struggle in these difficult times. Great. So it seems like I'm the right person because <laughs> <Yeah, ideally, right? laughs> <Yes. laughs> to be here. Wonderful. So I, maybe we can, we can just start off yes, and uh, I can uh, just uh, sort of show you a couple of the slides and uh -huh. just maybe talk about some of these basic ideas. Sure. But, but the moral dilemma is a sort of, I call it like the bread and butter of ethics, you know, mm. because uh, moral dilemmas are situations in which the moral agent faces, you know, two choices, sometimes more than two choices. Right. But for, for each of those choices, there's a good moral reason for doing that action. Mm -hmm. But of course, the problem is, as we all know, you can't do both actions. You can only do one, yeah. right? And, yeah. and, and that's the kicker, because by choosing one action, you don't choose the other. And thus, you know, you violate the moral good behind that action that you don't choose. Right. So by choosing one action, mm -hmm. you're not choosing the other. Right. And it's sort of almost like a catch-22 dilemma because you're sort of damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Right. It's, a, it's never black and white only. It's always a, a big gray area. It's almost never black and white. Mm -hmm. And that, that's precisely why they're called moral dilemmas because yeah. they are inescapable. Mm -hmm. There's good reasons for doing each of these actions, but you can't do both actions. You can only choose one. So whatever action you choose, you're violating the moral good associated with the other action. Yes. So I, I give examples of this in class. I, mm -hmm. I talk about this case. Um, it's sometimes referred to in the literature as the Afghan goat herds case, uh -huh. and it involved a, a man by the name of um, Petty Officer um, Marcus Luttrell. He was okay. with three other Navy SEALs, and they were in Af Afghanistan, mm -hmm. I'd say around 2005, and they were on a, um, a reconnaissance mission. And they were looking for a Taliban leader who was said to be a closest associate of right. Osama bin Laden. Mm. And they were just oh. 
household trying to gather information about him. Right. And they had set up base, mm -hmm. you know, in this sort of remote mountainous region overlooking the village, and they had just set up the surveillance equipment. Right. When two Afghan goat herds and a 14 year old boy who was with them uh -huh. just, I guess, wandered into their area. Right. And they had all their, like, you know, goats, you know, with right. them as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the soldiers didn't know what to do because they didn't have any rope. They couldn't simply tie the, 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 the goat herds and just leave them there. Right. It felt like they had two choices, either uh -huh. to let them go yeah. or kill them. Right. Now, this is not a thought experiment. This happened. Right. It's and, a real story. Right. And so reality. the audience might be familiar with this if they've seen the film Lone Survivor, mm -hmm. which stars, I think, Mark Wahlberg. And it kind of explains this, right. you know, um, but basically, uh, the soldiers split on what they should do, and ultimately, uh, Marcus Luttrell had the deciding vote, and right. he voted to let them go. Okay. I mean, he understood one of the soldiers' arguments, like, we have to kill them because they could, you know, report our right. whereabouts, and then our mission is in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. But he felt as a Christian, he just couldn't, you know, execute men in cold blood, right. so right. he let them go. Hmm. Within an hour, the soldiers found themselves surrounded by 60 or 70 Taliban fighters armed wow. with AK-47s hmm. and rocket-propelled grenades. In the fierce firefight that followed, right. all three of his comrades were killed. They even shot down a helicopter that was sent to rescue them, killing all 16 soldiers on board. And right. then if you just think of all the Taliban fighters who were also killed in this mm -hmm. you know, uh, conflict. Uh, Luttrell was severely wounded. He kind of basically like fell down a mountain sliding basically crawled seven miles to a Pashtun village which took him in until he was able to be rescued by the force, U.S. forces. Right. But later on, when he went back to the United States, mm -hmm. he, you know, was talking about his experiences and he couldn't, you know, he thought he had made the, the sort of stupidest decision of his life, you know. Right. And this is something I ask my students. This is a moral dilemma, yeah. right? You know, should he have shot them or should he have let them go? And, Usually what I do is I ask the students what they think. I don't mm -hmm. tell them the end of the story. I'd say, well, what do you think they should do here? Right. And m m like the students usually are split like 50-50 on this, you well, know? that's normal, yeah, right? Exactly, right. You know, and so some are like, well, you know, we should kill them because, you know, even the 14-year-old because this is war uh -huh. and this is what we do in order to protect our, our lives and the mission. But a lot of students, you know, say, well, wait a second. We just can't go around. Soldiers can't go around executing yeah. you know civilians yeah. non-combatants right. like cold blood don't yeah. we have like the geneva convention aren't there isn't there like sort of rules you know ethical of, things right, that you know they like follow. Codes, so, uh, soldiers follow yes. so um and then i ask them and then i tell them the end of the story mm -hmm. and the loss of life and right. then i ask them again do luttrell i mean he thought he made the wrong decision in the aftermath but then i asked him do you think he made the wrong decision or did he make the right decision even though the outcome wasn't desirable? Yeah. And I asked students, would any of you change your minds here? And so we get some interesting back and forth here when students try to sort of wrestle with some of the moral intuitions, like what really morally counts there, you know? Sounds like, like a great discussion well, that it, students it, can it, have, right? It usually is, yeah. The students are, you know, really energized by these kinds of conversations sure. because they're able to, you know, set forth their own moral intuitions. Yeah. They don't need to know all these different terminological ideas or mm -hmm. theories. I'll introduce them later, of course, sure. in the, in the yes. course of the semester. Uh -huh. But in the beginning, I, I tell them, listen, all of you have intuitions that easily fall under a lot of the theories that we're discussing. Yeah. And you'll see how that this is the case. So mm -hmm. don't think of philosophy as a sort of abstract, esoteric discipline that has no contact mm. with the real world. It does, it has a lot of contact. So, you know, um, so that's how I set up the moral dilemma, right? So the moral dilemma, these are really difficult situations. Mm. And, and, and in, in the class, we look at, you know, moral dilemmas that our society struggles with. So we talk about abortion, for example. Yeah, the termination, Exactly, yep. the termination of a pregnancy, right? Mm -hmm. Or euthanasia, right? Do terminally ill patients have a right to request doctors to help end their lives? Yeah. Or we talk about you know animals, uh, non-human animals. Do we have any rights or obligations? Mm -hmm. Should we be concerned about their welfare in any way, shape, or form? Right. Because those sort of questions may lead to very difficult you know um, uh, actions on our parts. You know, we may have to change our behavior, right. including what we wear, mm -hmm. what we put on, you know, perfume, or, right. or of course what we eat, mm -hmm. right? Definitely. Or testing, you know, mm -hmm. with animals. So those are all examples of moral dilemmas, you know, and. These are really difficult, you know, there doesn't, and that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to find, you mm -hmm. know, consensus on any of these issues in society. 
because there are strong moral reasons on each side. Yes. And so, you know, what we do in class is, you know, try to articulate the moral intuitions and ideas on each side and reason out how they make sense or not. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the vehicles through which I do this are called thought experiments. Okay. And so like thought experiments describe situations in which um, like the agent, you know, it forces us to think more deeply about, about you know, um, the principles at stake. And so it, it's almost a way to sort of test the moral theories that we develop against our intuitions here. Right. And sometimes that means we may have to jettison some moral intuitions that we find mm -hmm. just don't make sense as we push it through the, these sort of thought experiments. Right. And so, you know, occasionally we'll, I'll use thought experiments over the course of the semester, but mm -hmm. especially the first day we go through a whole bunch of them. And these, you know, these ones are um, referred to if uh, I'll That's just... a good start, right? Right, it so is. So many different examples to, for, to provoke them thinking. Exactly. And open up their minds and getting to know themselves, right? Right, and exactly. One of the purposes, I and think. get to know each other, find a way to sort of converse in a civil way with each other mm -hmm. about these sort True. of issues. And mm -hmm. I find sometimes thought experiments, because of the sort of abstractness of these thought experiments, mm -hmm. um, it's a way to engage students without necessarily inflaming their passions mm. or their prejudices or biases immediately, you know, because... I, I, like, I like that differences there. Right, because like if you take abortion, abortion is a very, especially in this country, mm -hmm. um, controversial issue. Very and divided too. People are very divided and they're very heated, right? Yes, it's a matter yeah. of life and death, Passionate you know, and it's a matter too. of your body. Yeah. And, so, you know, it's always a challenge. And most of the students' the classes do fantastically well mm. with this because we start to model like, like a civil dialogue um, and respectful dialogue from the very first day. Mm -hmm. And I find starting with thought experiments in, in these sort of trolley car experiments, as I'll explain in a second, kind of helps, you know, because it sort of um, uh, allows students to express their views mm. without necessarily offending anyone in the class because some right. of these situations are so like esoteric and abstract and far out there yeah. like it's almost impossible to happen and mm -hmm. of course when we get to the nitty-gritty and of course when we get to the actual moral principles we're discussing we start to see how they actually apply to yeah, our life around to us the real stories exactly yeah. but we start mm. in this way and right. so um Okay. So, for example, I have here um, uh, an example of um, this, the infamous trolley car experiment, right? And this is, um, like, imagine you're standing at um, a, a trolley switch, and you see there's a runaway trolley going down the track. Mm -hmm. And, if you, you know, maybe the driver has passed out or suffered a heart attack, and the trolley is heading down this track. And there are right. five people on this track. Mm -hmm. And they're going to die if the trolley continues. It's just going to plow through them and kill them all. Mm -hmm. But you're at the railroad so you switch. You can pull the switch and switch tracks so the trolley goes on the other track. Mm -hmm. And on this alternate track, you know, there's one man. Right. And this man will die mm -hmm. if the trolley hits him. Mm -hmm. So if you do nothing, the trolley kills these five people. Mm -hmm. If you pull the switch, it kills the one person. All right? Right. Now, I'm not going to ask you yet what you think because we're going to get to there, right? <laughs> but, 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 you know, I, I want to paint this picture, right? Because this is a very infamous sort of, um, or, you know, uh, trolley car sort of uh, like thought experiment. And it was introduced by uh, a British philosopher, Philippe Foote. And um, it was developed and a lot of variations were offered by Judith Jarvis Thompson, who's actually a really noted philosopher, especially um, she wrote a very uh, important sort of seminal essay on abortion you know, uh -huh. um, a, a few years before Roe v. Wade. And so, right. um, but she developed a lot of really interesting variations of this thought experiment. Mm -hmm. And uh, this field has proliferated to such a degree that it has its own like name. So it's called like trolleyology, right? It's like, yeah. <laughs> so it's the first like, time I'm hearing that word it, today. It's, yeah, it's a strange <laughs> genealogism, but it's like the sort of um, like, it's this field of like trolley car hypothetical scenarios. Right. And if you, you know, the audience goes online and you type in trolley car, you know, like experience, there's like, like hundreds of different variants, you right. know, and there's lots of memes now making fun of certain things or uh -huh. putting in, you know, political issues in terms of these trolley car like oh, yeah. experiences. Sure. Um, there's a great show, um, it was ran on NBC for a while called The Good Place. It's a very 
philosophical show. It connected moral philosophy with a really sort mm -hmm. of engaging story. Right. And there's a really sort of um, unforgettable episode where they deal with the trolley car experiment. And it's a, an interesting solution to it, right? But, um, right. but you know, like, um, like philosophers and psychologists have, have run lots of different studies on this problem. And it's sort of, you know, because they've like mined this field to sort of figure out like the inner workings of the moral mind, you know, yeah. like what does this tell us? Like how do people's responses to these sorts of thought experiments, yeah. what do they tell us about, you know, yeah. how we work, how we make moral judgments? Yeah. Like what do we consider to be important? And what do they process? What's going on exactly. in, the, in the decision making process? Exactly. What they consider to be important, what, mm. what, what has more importance, what doesn't. And yeah. we're going to do this as well. So we're going to run through a series of these. Oh, a guinea okay. pig today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You know, you're, you're my student today, like all my, my, my students, they would sort of work out their sort of, you know, responses to these sorts of experiments. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, they've done some studies and they've shown in these sort of, you know, kill one to save five kind of scenarios right. that, that they find in general men are more likely to push the switch than mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. Younger people are more likely to push the switch. Uh -huh. And then I don't want to say it gets silly, but it starts to go off into these strange sort of tangents where they say like you might be more willing to pull the switch if you listen to a foreign language or if you oh. smell Parmesan cheese or if you watch like clips of Saturday Night Live uh -huh. and you know or if you um, like listen to clips of sound of people farting. Right? And I think some of these sort of examples go a little off, you know, right. but it's very interesting. This, this sort of denotes a sort of, you know, interest really people have in these sort of experiments and the sort of hope that we might get a better sense of what's going on when we act morally or make moral judgments. Is there, is there like a statistics when you say people are, are prone to make the decision to pull the plug? Right. I mean, is there... Do, oh, do like, know? like, so, I mean, I, I guess these are studies that are run, right? right. So, um, you know, some studies, you know, they're limited by their sampling, oh, okay. right? So, gotcha. but, um, you know, I don't have like the precise uh, That's okay. details of the studies, but, but I'm um, just curious. What's that? Forty, sixty, or seventy, thirty? Yeah, I, I think like um, I, I read the majority of, of male students as anything over fifty. You know, I'll okay. just get safe. Yeah. You know, anything well, over fifty, yeah. sixty percent, or something like okay. that. But again, you know, you're limited by the sort of sample size that sure, you're using. Sure. And I think a lot of these sort of um, studies are probably done in universities, so they're drawing from samples of students right, and things right. like that. Um, so, I, I set up two of these uh -huh. experiments for my students, and so okay. the first one, and maybe we can just kind of work through it, and you can tell me what your sort of gut intuition says here. Okay. okay. So in the first one, you're you have a, and you know, unfortunately, this of course is something we've experienced in our society today, especially in terms of COVID nineteen pandemic. Mm -hmm. But you have a pill that cures a, a mortal disease that people are suffering from. Right. Five people are stricken with this disease, mm -hmm. but because it's in its early stages, if you, give, if you split up this pill into five parts and give it to these five people, you can save their lives. Mm -hmm. But there's another person who has a more advanced, in this disease that's advanced more progressively in them, and, and they're gonna die unless they have the full dose. Right. So if you give the one pill to this, the one person, they'll live, but the five people will die. Mm. If you cut this pill into five pieces and give it to the five people, they'll live, mm -hmm. but the one person will die. Mm -hmm. I call this one person blogs. It's the sort of name that they sometimes use in these experiments. Okay. Right? What would you do? Would you give the pill to the five or would you give the pill to the one? Uh, well, I guess uh, I think saving five people seem to be you know, like more, uh, more lives to be saved. I mean, in terms of quantity. <laughs> right, well, no, I mean like the needs <laughs> of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Is that the yeah. sort of idea, like the greater good, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah and, and, and listen, this is an intuition that almost every single class I've ever given, all my students have mm -hmm. almost always chosen to save the five, right? right? They feel bad, and uh, of course, and I'm telling them, listen, this is hypothetical, so don't worry, yeah. you're not killing anyone, but you know, um, you save the five, right? Mm -hmm. And then I give them a second case. So in the second case, you're a doctor mm -hmm. and you have five sick patients who are in need of various organs. Yeah. And if they don't get these organs, they will die, mm -hmm. right? And in steps a healthy patient named Bloggs. And you discover that maybe he's the ideal transplant organ candidate. And you could take these organs, heart, liver, kidneys, and whatnot from him and give them to these five patients. 
these five patients will live. Mm. Let's just assume, and uh, lots of assumptions here, right? Let's just assume that the patients are not, the bodies are not going to reject these organs. They have a fairly good chance of surviving and living, but of course, blogs will die. Yeah. And you'll, you know, you'll have to cut them open and take out these organs. And you ask blogs, you know, kindly, well, would you ever consider being an organ donor? The blog says, no, I, I, my body is sacred. It's a temple. I would not want to ever give my organs out, right. even were I to die, right? Mm. But you realize you could overpower blogs, put them under, cut them open, take out his organs, give it to these five people. And let's just say... Against his wish. Of course, against his wish, against his consent. Right. But um, you would... Uh, and and you, there's a way for you to sort of... Um, get away with it, no one would ever find out. Because I don't want legal consequences sure. to be the to reason be why way. students would make mm -hmm. that decision, right? Because mm -hmm. then, then if students say, well, I don't want to get, you know, you know, I don't want to lose my license, I don't want to get thrown sure. in jail, you yeah. know? And I'm like, well, okay, let's imagine you, you, you know a group of people who are similar mind to you and you can sort of conceal all this. Right. And they say, well, that's not realistic. And I say, of course it's not realistic. This is a hypothetical experiment, mm -hmm. but we want to get to the sort of the principle here, right? Right, right. Um, and what would you do in this case? Would you kill the one to save the five? Against his wish, right? Against his wish. I'm kind of getting. Um, I'm, I'm <laughs> okay, I, I see where it's going because uh, it seems like it's going to be contradictory to my previous uh, decision. Exactly. Why? Maybe you could sort of flesh out that intuition. Well, the, the, the first one is uh, the doctor gets to choose. The second one, the doctor also gets to choose, but he had an opportunity to ask the patient for consent. But uh, the previously he didn't, right? Right. Or right. I don't know whether that's the, uh, the, the determining point. Well, I'm, I'll introduce a wrinkle, but maybe uh, after you explain why you think that like what, like what decision then would you make in the second case? Oh, well, <laughs> well, uh, that, yeah, that's a, I, I don't know. The knife feels slightly different because the, the, in the second scenario, the, the person verbalized his wish and we are doing it yes. against him. Yes. And that, that is uh, versus a, uh, the, per the, the first scenario, the person doesn't know, and uh, he was uh, more blinded. Then I, yeah, I don't know. That seems like there's more human rights you are fighting against for the second case, and uh, the not, yeah, I don't know. But no, no, you're right. I mean, like in the second case, because almost all my students will say, there's only a few who try to hold on to a certain type of consistency. Mm -hmm. But in the second case, most of the students will say, we can't kill this one person. That's murder. That's like, you know, violating his right to life. That's a direct violation of his right to life. We right. even asked him and he said no. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so, um, you know, so, you know, I, this is at this point that I kind of went, well, wait a second. Now I'm confused because, you know, I thought in the first case, and you picked up on this right away, of course, right? Um, in the first case, you said the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So, you know, I usually set this up where I ask students, well, it's obviously what you'll do in the second case. You'll kill the one person. And they're like, no, and it takes a second for them to think about it. They're like, no, we wouldn't. And I'm like, but the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. What makes a difference here? Hmm. And students will say, well, you know, we, he didn't, didn't give his consent. Yeah. So then I asked them a follow-up question in the first case. What if the first patient blogs knew what uh -huh. was going on and is pleading with you on his hands and knees to give pleading the pill? Pleading to help or pleading to have the pill? To have the pill, please. You know, because I, I want to make it difficult, you know, obviously, it, it, to make students really think about these distinctions. Mm. And what a blog says, if you don't give me the pill, you're killing me. You're violating my right to life. Mm. And students are like, oh. Like, oh, no. Are we killing him? Is this the same as the second case? But is it the same as the second case? No. Because what kills blogs in the first case if you don't give them this pill? Mm -hmm. The disease, of course. Mm -hmm. The disease kills him. Right. You're not actually killing him at all. You're letting him die, right? Yeah. Because you're, um, you're not giving the pill and you're letting the disease take its course, right? Right. More passively. Yes. You know, you are letting him die, mm -hmm. and, but you're not performing any actions that directly violate his right to life. True. So you're not committing any actions. You're omitting. So we sometimes talk about this distinction between commission where you perform an action and yeah. omission, where you don't perform a certain action. True. And so 
Because I tell my students, you're not murderers. I look in your eyes, you're not murderers, even hypothetical murderers. I say, no, this obviously is a difference between the action of letting die versus the action of killing. Yeah. And we would all agree that it's important that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. However, mm -hmm. there seem to be limits to that approach. And one of the limits is I ought not to violate the right to life of another person. Mm. So I get them in a nice, comfortable place. Okay. They had a, a little bit of a contradiction, a little bit of conflict, but we ironed out a really interesting distinction, like the distinction between the action of killing and the action of letting die. And then mm. I spring the next case on them, because the next race, of course, breaks <laughs> their previous framework, right? Okay. <laughs> so this is the trolley car example okay. once more. You're at the, the, rail, the switch, uh -huh. and the trolley, let's say the driver's passed out, you know, suffered went into cardiac arrest, we don't know, mm -hmm. but the trolley's out of control. It's gonna go straight down this track and kill five people. The, the driver's not aware, you know, he's unconscious, so he can't pull the brake. Mm. However, you're at the switch, and you can switch tracks and go to another track where it's not being used, right? And, but there is one other person on that track. Right. That person will die if you switch. Mm -hmm. What would you do in this case? <laughs> do I have an option to bring like a big uh, block of a uh, rock and uh, stop the train? You generally don't carry <laughs> cinder blocks in your backpack or anything like that. So soon, you know, you're not going to be like, oh yeah, I can throw like the block or, or you know, jam the, the the tracks and whatever. <laughs> no, nope, so so like because students are always like, can I yell? Get off the track! <laughs> I'm pulling the or switch. Or save those people who right. are tied up there. Right, right you now. know, like. And I tell my students, I understand there seem to be limitations here, yeah. you know, because students are always looking for like a third alternative. And, mm -hmm. and I'll grant you in life, life offers a lot of messy alternatives, oh, yes. right? Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the virtues and the, uh, one of the strengths and weaknesses of these thought experiments is right. that they sort of boil down our, our judgments to really two choices mm -hmm. because we want to get at stake you know, we want to abstract and focus on a particular value at stake here, right? And here's right. a distinction between killing and letting die, right? Mm -hmm. And so I want to see what, you know, we want to see what moral intuitions students, people bring into these questions, right? right? I use another example like, um, so, you know, um, you're like an undersea cave and you're exploring the natural, the beauty of the natural formations of the cave and you're with 10 nine other people okay. and there's an earthquake and all of a sudden everyone is panicking and a large man pushes past everyone and is running out to the entrance of the cave mm -hmm. but he gets stuck as the cave is falling okay. and his like feet are sticking inside the cave mm -hmm. and his torso his upper torso his you know head are outside, outside. the cave okay uh, he's alive you know mm -hmm. probably hurt but he's alive and he's jammed tight right. in this cave and this cave is below sea level and uh -huh. you see there's cracks on the ocean on the on the, on the cave floor and the water's coming in uh -huh. Everyone will drown in within 10 minutes. Right. And I tell my students, you always come prepared, so you have a stick of dynamite in your purse, just because, you know? And, uh, you know, you could light this dynamite, put it in this man's, you know, you know right. pants pocket, blow him up and blow out an entrance to the cave. He'll die. He'll die from this. But you'll save yourself and eight other people. What can do we do? consent him <laughs> hey, And I'm going to say, no, he doesn't want to die. He can oh, hear okay. you and says, no, please, right. I don't want to die. Oh my. Okay. Always remove the issue of consent here. We want to get to the idea of killing here and right. make it a little bit trickier. Uh -huh. But even, even with the issue of consent, that can sometimes be very problematic, right? I had a really interesting conversation with my students the other day where I gave them another case where uh, um, this is the case of the, the cannibal from Rotterdam, uh, Arnim Maibes. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he had sent a really weird sort of request on, uh, like, I guess, a German equivalent of Craigslist in 2003. Right. He was looking for someone he could eat and kill. So uh -huh. um, actually, a lot of people responded to this, but he selected a man by the name of Bernd Brandes okay. to to meet, and so he took him to his house in his summer house in Germany, uh -huh. and he, you know, they had a nice dinner together. He, you know, Brandes took some sleeping pills, mixed them with schnapps, drank them down. Unfortunately, he was still conscious when. Um, Maivez removed a certain organ from him, chopped oh, it off, Lord. and offered it him to eat. And he, then he stabbed Brandes to death. Over the next couple of months, he, sorry, I should have prefaced this with this sort of warning, you know, it was very grisly. He cut him up, froze him, and then over the next couple of months, you know, thawed him out and ate him over candlelight with, you know, finest cutlery, right? Of course, there was a record here and authorities found him. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, at least, at first the German authorities were a little bit kind of uh, thrown for a loop because, you know, cannibalism, they don't actually have a law against cannibalism. They initially tried him for manslaughter. I think he got eight and a half years. There was a public outcry when that happened. 
They tried him again for murder, and now he's sentenced to life. Okay. Actually, a movie made about this, and he wrote a book. Like, really? It's like, okay. called The Cannibal from Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. But it raised the question of consent, that, which is what we were you know, talking about before, right? Like, and I always ask my students, are there limits to consent? Mm. Are there like any sort of, or is consent the crucial value that we have? That as long as I consent to something, it's okay. Yeah. Or there's some actions that by their very nature, mm -hmm. I'm unable to give consent to. Right, I, I would, uh, well, from, from the, uh, some religious teachers I know, they, they would say, you, you don't cause the death of the person who, maybe the, the person who is uh, being dynamited, right. you know, just injure him and don't kill him, and, but save the most of others, if you do have an option. Or it seems like, uh, yeah, and uh, the, the second scenario that uh, consent, if somebody want to kill themselves, like, like a suicidal, even with the consent, it's still not right. Right. Okay. Right? So, I mean, so yeah. So we think about the value of life, and life is important. And if someone asks another individual to help kill them, yeah, that other person shouldn't do it. It's not morally right, even though the person is looking to die. Yeah, with consent, still there's a there is a moral issue that's uh, generally uh, perceived and uh, accepted. Fantastic. So we're going to hold on to that insight for a second. Okay. We're going to go back to our cave, okay? Sure. In the cave, Fat Man's like, I don't want to die. I have so much to live for. Please uh -huh. don't blow me up. Uh -huh. Now you suggested, is there a possibility we could stick the dynamite near him so we could injure him but not kill him and gets blown out? And then I say no. <laughs> I know it's going to kill him. And the reason I do this is because I really want to get uh, a better sense of what students' intuitions are when they're faced with the choice between, you know, of, of, of killing an innocent person. Right. And, you know, I, I tell them, you know, like there's a character, I think we were talking about this earlier um, before, um, uh, before this episode where um, the show MacGyver, Richard Dean Anderson played MacGyver. And yes, I love that show. I know MacGyver's so great, right? Because whatever problems he gets into, he's able to get out of them with like, like, Always. like a pen and a paper clip and, right, you know, like know. chewing gum, you know, he could be like locked in, hanging upside down, you know, in a building that's ready to collapse, you know, with a bomb set off. And he's able to escape with all these objects and mm -hmm. disarm the bomb, you know, and, and capture the criminal, of course. And nobody gets hurt and no one gets uh, always hurt. Uh, works out well. Yes, you're right off into the sunset, right? There is no MacGyvers in this cave. I no. tell them there's no ethical MacGyvering. There's mm -hmm. no like third alternative in these sort of thought experiments. Right. Now, of course, life is much messier mm -hmm. and there should be alternatives, you know, and it was really interesting when, you know, um, in the, case, the Afghan goat herd case, you know, um, in, you know, um, Marcus Luttrell, after he survived his experiences, he wrote a book about it called Operation Red Wings. And that's what they, that, that, that became the basis for the movie Lone Survivor. Right, right. And he was, you know, on tour talking about his experiences and, and people in the audience would raise this, like, why didn't you, you know, like knock them, them out or incapacitate them in some way? Wasn't there another option? Mm -hmm. My students ask the same question and it's an understandable question. You know, wasn't there another way to do this? Yeah. I mean, it was such a stark decision, like kill them or let it's them so, go. Yeah, it's, is, is there a, like a sort of in between, mm -hmm. right? A third, you know, option. And he said, well, listen, you know, there's no um, algorithm, right, for these situations. We were in a tough situation mm. and we felt these were the choices that we had to make. Right. So, you know, this comes into uh, focus as we start to talk, and I'll talk a little bit more about like real world applications of these. Oh, sort of I can think of some already now, like politics. And politics, <laughs> yes. Parties, and, you know. And of course, you know, we're going to be talking about pandemics as well. Yes, and so, you know, so let's return back to the trolley car case mm -hmm. then. You're standing at the switch, the runaway trolley is coming down. Mm -hmm. You can pull the switch and divert it from its track, killing one person, but saving the five. Right. Or you can let it run and all five will die. What do you do? All right, you, you come back to this. I guess I'll pick the one, I'll, I'll pull the, the plug. And but aren't you killing him? Aren't you violating oh, his right I to life? Oh, I am aware of that, yes. So there are some cases then when it's permissible to kill an innocent person for the sake of the greater good. Uh, yeah, I guess so. When it, it comes to that choice and the decision, this is a very difficult decision, right? Because, you know, I, I sometimes talk about this idea of negative responsibility, which is a concept that's often used in mm -hmm. ethical literature. 
Um, we're all familiar with the idea of responsibility. Like you're responsible for what you do, right? Yeah. If I, you know, uh -huh. you know, if I attack someone or steal from someone, I'm responsible for those consequences of my actions, yes. and I should, you know, presumably be punished accordingly, mm -hmm. right? Sure. But we also think about negative responsibility, where we talk about not only things we are responsible for, but things that we haven't done that we are responsible right. for, mm -hmm. right? So totally. we're responsible for our inaction as well. Mm -hmm. Like if um. You know, and there's a sort of legal recognition of this idea with Good Samaritan laws where um, you can be held accountable in some states if you don't help out uh, a person who's being, who's in hurt. I used for students the example of uh, the Seinfeld, Seinfeld uh, series finale right. where they're in a town in New Hampshire uh -huh. and someone is getting, you know, mugged. And, right. you know, the Seinfeld characters are like some of the worst human beings in terms of pettiness and vices and stuff. So oh, it's they're so much fun. I, they are. And it's a fantastic, you know, character study of uh -huh. like Aristotle's vices, you know, and, but you know, they're, they're videotaping it. They're cracking jokes, you know, about this person's weight and stuff. Oh yeah. And so then they get sort of put on trial and uh -huh. it's just a sort of oh, overview yeah, I remember that of their episode. character yeah. traits and stuff. And of course yeah. they're found guilty, right? Uh -huh. But you know, it's sort of, I use that as a numerous example of a good Samaritan law. Like you would be held accountable to some degree for your inaction here, yeah. where you could have helped someone and you didn't. Now I'm not talking about cases where, you know, someone, um, you know, goes into cardiac arrest, you know, no one that's is expecting you to do CPR, no professional. Right, 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 if you don't have that professional that's a, expertise. Yeah, that's a totally different story. That's a different story. But presumably, you know, like if someone, you know, collapsed in front of you, mm -hmm. you would at least try to help them call 911 or something, yeah. you yeah. know? So like I use the example of Wesley Autry, who was a few years ago, uh, a bit ago, he was like, imagine you're on the subway platform with your two children, your two girls, and someone falls on into the tracks. Mm -hmm. And there's an oncoming train going towards it, to the station. Right. He jumps off the platform, covers the man with his body, flattens his body, and the train runs over them both. But because he flattened his body, the train actually didn't strike them because uh, the man who had fallen in probably would have panicked and tried to get up and been struck by the train. But because he kept his body flat, the train, you know, went over them and they were not injured. Oh, and all he, of them? Both of them were saved, oh, right? Okay. He saved this man's life. Mm. And he was referred to as a subway hero. This is a big story right. like 15 so years ago right, in right. New York City, you know, uh -huh. and um, you know, of course, every politician wanted to meet him, you know, wanted to sort of get that good sure. feeling, shaking his hand that, you know, the public was regarding him as a subway hero. Aus auspicious feel. Exactly, right? You know, and just like, just to be associated with that, right? <laughs> you know, but um, no one is expecting you to do that, right? Mm. I mean, he had some military training. He was able to keep calm and cool under circumstances. Right. But again, you know, when I'm talking about negative responsibility, I'm talking about, at the very least, you know, we should in some circumstances we find we have an obligate or we ought to have an obligation to help people mm -hmm. in whatever way we're able to sure right? well, so, you put it like negative sometimes it's a uh, it's a choice of word i mean uh, uh, yeah well I, i'm a musician like people talk about the sound but the silence is equally as important exactly that's a part of it. it it's not the music is not full when there's no silence so the negative part is part of it the whole thing as well Exactly. It's just the way we put it. Right. Like responsibility is an issue not just of our action, but also our inaction. Totally. We can just as be held it's accountable. It's a whole package. Exactly. We can just held to be just as accountable for what mm -hmm. we do as what we fail to do. Exactly. And this is something that Peter Singer, a prominent philosopher, talks a lot about. Mm -hmm. You know, what are our obligations to help the poor, yeah. especially the poor around the world, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. if, my, if I could donate money that I would otherwise use for luxury, to buy my, you know, Vente double shot cappuccino from like, I don't know, Starbucks. Right. If I could donate that $10, $15 to an organization that might help a child probably be fed for a week or two mm -hmm. in maybe a third world country, yeah. don't have an obligation to do that? Or am I failing to do an obligation if I don't donate that money, mm -hmm. right? And so he, he presents a very um, um, strong call for responsibility in this yes. case. So I asked my students, you know, after we talk about this idea of negative responsibility, I asked them, well, would you, um, do you feel that we have an obligation sometimes to perform immoral actions for the mm -hmm. sake of the greater good? That is, are you to blame if you don't pull the switch? Are you to blame for the deaths of the five people? Is your inaction, are you morally accountable for your inaction if you don't pull the switch? Mm -hmm. Even though pulling the switch violates another person's right to life. Yeah. I, I hear you. 
What do you think? <laughs> oh, you're <laughs> asking what for an think? answer. <laughs> um, well, I think either way you are morally responsible, but uh, you know, it's, a, it's a matter of choice. But sometimes a, decision, a, a good decision on, at the, on the spot doesn't always guarantee the best result. And that, that's something we kind of expect, but it do, doesn't always go that tr track. You know? I mean, that's a great point to, to emphasize because that's exactly one of the sort of concerns in that, you know, like I'll make an argument that, you know, Marco Sutrell made the right choice not to shoot the goat herds and the 14 year old boy mm -hmm. in cold blood. That was the right decision, even though the consequences or the outcome of that action was horrific. Yeah. The toll in life was uh -huh. awful. But then I ask my students, perhaps when we talk about right and wrong, we're not merely mm. thinking about the outcome of an action. Right. Right. That's sometimes referred to as consequentialism. Oh, totally. Where the consequences of an action mm -hmm. determines moral value. Yeah. But maybe we're talking about principles that yeah, we act under. You know, what, what are like the kinds of actions we ought to perform or mm -hmm. we ought not to perform? Yeah. Right? Uh, may I share a story that I, I, I saw last night? It's a cur The Courier. It's a movie that uh, I think it was reflected in the story of new nuclear war between Russia and the states, and that, that was stationed in Cuba. Oh, it's terrifying. So, yeah, it's, <laughs> so uh, to save you the, the, the details that you might oh. want, want to watch later yeah, on. Yeah, no spoilers, yes. right? <laughs> um, it seem, it, it's the same thing. It's like uh, the, the person made the decision to save, but uh, he got put into jail and his fa family suffers, and, uh, but the outcome was actually uh, it's not as good as he thought, but he still saved millions of people. Right. So it, it's, you, you cannot guarantee uh, the result upcoming, but you, you can only make the right decision on the spot with the, every single thing considered. I think that's our responsibility. But what goes beyond that is not our responsibility because it has a, uh, you know, in Buddhism we talk about the, uh, uh, conditions and the affinities and the causes, this is all change every single second of it, which we are not in control at any moment of it. But right. I mean, that's a great point. Um, and philosophers also talk about this issue in terms of the problem of moral luck. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. um, you know, because if we think that we are accountable only for our actions, mm -hmm. you know, our intentions and our actions, and we can't control the outcomes, you know, yeah. it seems that sometimes we might heal, hold people more accountable, mm -hmm. even though they're you know, in an identical situation to someone else who's acted the same way, but they had a good outcome. Let me give yeah. you an example of this, okay. because sometimes, again, like examples really help us to sort of you know, picture these principles. Uh -huh. I, let's, I, I, or a driver, I, I, get dr I'm, I, I, I drink and I drive home drunk. You know? Mm -hmm. I know I shouldn't do it, but right. I do it, right? And I'm speeding, uh, but I make it home and I'm safe. No one got hurt, right. okay? But I did something I really shouldn't have. I was morally irresponsible. I not yeah. only broke the law, but you know, I did something really you know, reckless. Let's just say it, yeah. reckless. Uh -huh. Now in the second scenario, it's exactly like the first scenario. I get drunk, I drive, but this time it's late at, like a pretty getting late night and a child runs out playing a game of tag, right. late You're night tag, lucky. and I kill that child. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we would say, at least legally, I would be held, of course, mm -hmm. you know, for manslaughter at the very least, if not sure. other aggravated charges. Mm -hmm. Morally speaking, am I to be evaluated worse than the other example where I was lucky no. in driving home? No. Or should I be held accountable in the same way? Well, I would say the same way because you're taking the same risk. It's just the second scenario, you, uh, there happened to be a child there. I mean, it's a, it's a chance. So would we hold someone who got drunk and drove home as you basically are akin to someone who killed someone? And I, but I didn't kill anyone. I just drove home and I got there, you know? Yeah, I, I hear you. Yeah. But, but this is a problem um, that a lot of, like, some philosophers really like to talk about. But again, it's exactly what you're discussing. You know, how do we consider the impact of the outcome on our moral status, you know, on our status as moral agents, right? Mm. So you're pulling the switch. You're saying in this situation, yep. There are circumstances that justify me to kill someone mm -hmm. for the sake of the greater good. Obviously, if there was another way to do it, you would do it in a heartbeat, but there mm -hmm. isn't. Yeah. So let me ask you if you do the, if you'd hold on to your decision in this oh, that, last this case. This gets harder. It gets harder and harder. <laughs> <laughs> the students start to think I'm a very sadistic by the end. In this case, you have a runaway trolley. Five people are on the, on the track mm -hmm. and you see the trolley 
and you know, you look behind, on the, you're on a footbridge with another man, and you see the trolley, and it's coming straight for these five people. And uh -huh. you, you say to yourself, you know, you're looking and you realize you have to make a split second decision. Now you're an altruistic person, Joanne, right? You know, if you could, you would- Maybe. Uh, I, 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 I give you the, 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 the significance of the doubt. Or the, the, I'm taking it that you're gonna do the right thing. Now you would, if you could, jump off the footbridge and sacrifice yourself uh -huh. as if your body could stop the trolley, but you're not, probably not big enough to jam up, it's kind of gr gruesome here, to, to stop the trolley. But there's a large pedestrian next to you, let's call him Blogs, and, he goes, and he's maybe looking the opposite way and he's saying, oh, look at those people tied there, what's going on? You know? And he's looking down and you realize that you can push him over onto the path, preventing from trolley from striking and killing the five people. Do you do mm. it? Well, this is similar to the previous example. This is a, it's actually in action. You, you are killing in action. The other one is more like a, a in the negative uh, way of uh, Well, you're action. still killing him, aren't you? Still killing him whether you pulling. pull a switch or push him over? Or do you yeah. think there's a difference? Uh, well, there's no difference. There's no difference. Okay, so if you're saying really you're still trading off one life for five, I think you're right. There is no difference. Although students will be want to pull the switch but not push the man off the footbridge. And sometimes, you know, some like studies say there's like an ick factor involved when you have to get your hands dirty, so to speak, when mm -hmm. you're directly doing the action. Yeah. But, you know, whether you're pulling a trigger mm -hmm. of a gun aimed at someone, stabbing someone, or pushing a button that launches it's a missile the at the person. Yeah. It's the same, yeah. right? You get the same trade-off on oh, yeah. right? Uh -huh. so, so this is the idea that we talk a lot about in the sort of first uh, you know, class. You know, we make this distinction between you know, um, uh, letting die and killing, so um, action and inaction. Mm -hmm. And we talk about the different types of responsibilities that correspond mm -hmm. to that distinction. Yeah. And so, you know, and all through this, just as is in our conversation, mm -hmm. we're talking about really two basic moral viewpoints um, that occupy a lot of the real estate and moral philosophy today, mm -hmm. like the, occupy a lot of the moral landscape, you know. Yeah. And one is the sort of deontology. Um, Immanuel Kant is a philosopher who talks about this, who says we should be focusing on the intention and our duties mm -hmm. and rights, and there are certain types of actions we can perform right. and some we can't. Uh -huh. Damn the consequences, regardless of the consequences, right? It's all about, it's a matter of principle. Right. On the other hand, we have, you know, a consequentialist approach. Right. One example of consequentialism is the idea of utilitarianism. And that's like the, whatever maximizes the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest number of people in that situation, that's what we do. That's sort of like the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Yeah. And that's a sort of very strong intuition as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, by this time, my students, even if they don't know the terms, right. they are very familiar with those intuitions, mm -hmm. animating those terms, because they're using them in our back and forth throughout the conversation, mm. right? And then I kind of push it a little further because I then attach all these abstract thought experiments mm -hmm. to an actual moral dilemma that okay. you know, we all face or we will be facing at some point in our lives. Mm -hmm. So remember, we talked a little bit about euthanasia, you know, mm. at the beginning of, the, of, the, of this conversation. And euthanasia, you know, um, is sometimes when we refer to the kind of action we're performing, people sometimes make a difference between passive and active euthanasia. So like passive euthanasia is sometimes referred to as sort of pulling the plug. Mm. It's when you withdraw life support right. um, or treatment to a patient. Uh, right. Like a, I'm familiar with the DNR, right? right. Like a do not resuscitate. Yeah. And that would be an example of you know, passive right. euthanasia. Uh -huh. Or if a euthanasia, you know, if, if a patient you know, no longer wants to be given a certain antibiotic treatment or whatnot. Right, like that. Right. Now that is generally viewed as letting die, that you're not killing yeah. the patient because uh -huh. you know, the disease is taking its course. You're right. letting nature take its course. That's right? right, and that's legal in this country. Mm -hmm. It's legal in most countries. Right. Um, but then there's another more controversial form of euthanasia called active euthanasia, mm -hmm. and that's when uh, you know the doctor or healthcare professional performs an action that ends the patient's life. Right, right? Mm -hmm. like that could be you know maybe injecting more morphine with the intention to stop the patient's heart. That might be mm -hmm. giving them a drug that kills the patient. Right, uh, a very sort of infamous case of this was Dr. Kevorkian or Dr. Death who mm -hmm. would concoct these sort of machines to help end patients' lives. He was arrested, you know, because, you know, we do this as killing, killing is illegal. Right. And, you know, um, 
in the, in the United States in general, active euthanasia is prohibited. Right. However, however, there are some states that have programs that allow for active euthanasia. But oh. there's like a sort of battery of safeguards associated with this, right? right? You like, you have you're suffering from a sort of um, terminal illness. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you you're of sound mind. You know, this is really important because the patient has to consent to this. So they have to be aware of what they're consenting right. to. They have the process of reflection so mm -hmm. they can think about this. Yes. And you know, um, so these sort of safeguards are in place. And so states like Washington, Oregon, Vermont, California. Are, are engaged in these sorts of, you know, um, programs, right? And, right. you know, there's other, it's, you know, there's uh, New Mexico, I think the state, the uh, Supreme State Court of Colorado recently passed something right. um, allowing for active euthanasia. But in Not other words... Not in New York State yet. Yet. And I think this is a crucial thing. I think there's legislation, you know, coming up for this in mm -hmm. the next few years. And mm -hmm. so I tell my, you know, students, you know, I mean, end-of-life decisions are some of the most difficult decisions you must make, especially for your loved ones, you know, when it comes to respecting their decisions and eventually for yourself, yeah. you know? And so surprisingly enough, I tell them, this distinction of passive and active euthanasia matches quite nicely to the letting die and killing distinction we've been talking about mm -hmm. through all these abstract, moral, esoteric thought experiments. Right. So we boil down to, you know, when killing is morally permissible and when it isn't. Right. So this again connects to the conversation we were talking about mm -hmm. with consent. Yeah. Is it okay to kill a terminally ill patient if that's what they're consenting, they're requesting the doctor to do, mm -hmm. right? So these are all questions that we start to see possible ways of exploring these ideas and reflecting on these judgments, mm -hmm. right? So it's a pretty, you know, um, it's, it's a lot we do in the first day, but it's a way for them to kind of get a sense of how these thought experiments as you know, esoteric and abstract as they seem to be, can have real life impact and consequences in how we talk about moral judgments mm -hmm. and how we think about our moral intuitions. That, that's good. It just uh, shows the complexities of life and uh, to also know there are more options there and different ways of approach uh, that decision-making part. Exactly, right? And so, um, you know, then you know, I wanted to just mention briefly, I think we have a little bit of time here to mention very briefly, um, la, there was this experiment done by a, a graduate student by the name of Dries uh, Boston. And mm -hmm. he, um, he basically gives a sort of real life version of the trolley car experiment. Right. He says, you know, so imagine you're a group of students, you do a series of these hypothetical scenarios that we've been talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And like, you, you know, maybe you write down you know, your responses. What would you do? Will I pull the switch or not? Would I push the uh, blogs over the footbridge and, you know, like, you know, killing him to stop the trolley from killing the five people? And they give their responses. And then the last response they have, okay, you're in a situation where you could push a button to zap a living, breathing creature, a mouse. If you don't push the button, um, five living, breathing creatures, other mice will be zapped instead. So, you know, instead of talking about, um, you know, trolley cars and, and, and human victims, we've moved to an electric shock machine and, you know, a colony of mice, right? Uh -huh. So you've got two cages. One cage, you've got five mice in it. Another cage, you've got one mouse. Uh -huh. There's an electric shock that's going to generate in 20 seconds and electrocute the five mice in the cage. It, it won't kill them, but it would be very painful for them. Now, you can divert that charge so it only electrocutes one mouse in the other. Uh -huh. What would you do? And then they said, this is not a hypothetical experiment. This is the scenario right now, and they have like maybe a video of the cage, and they see the mice there, and they have to determine whether they're pressing the button or not, and that's going to move the electrical shock. And this is IRB approved. <laughs> it is, it is, and you'll see why in a second, right? Okay. Because so so what what was really interesting about this, of course, you know, and, and of course this is modeled, I think, after the famous obedience experiment by Stanley Milgram. Mm. So Stanley Milgram, in you know, in the '60s, was you know, thinking about Nazi Germany, and he was thinking about, you know, how did like a phenomenon like the Holocaust ever come about? This horrific mm -hmm. situation where right. it seemed like ordinary German citizens were able to do the most horrific things, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and and how? Like it just, you know, it was because they were so susceptible to authority. So he mm -hmm. set up an experiment. You know, he wanted to go to Germany, but he had difficulty going to Germany to test it. So he decided to do in the good old US of A, right? And so, you know, he sets up in Yale and he um, has an experiment where he has students come in and says, we have like a, 
a brand new uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, pedagogical learning experiment where you know, you know, you are going to be the teacher, and this other person, we'll call him Blocks, is going to be the student, okay? And he's going to be in the other room. You meet him, and then he goes into the other room. You can't see him, but you're responding to him through like a sort of microphone, and he's mm -hmm. responding back. Now, you, I guess, repeat a string of words, and then he has to repeat them back exactly. And here's the kicker. If he fails to do it, mm -hmm. you push a button, and it gives him a zap. You mm -hmm. electrocute him. And each time he fails to do it, you increase the voltage. And the idea is you know, negative conditioning, I suppose, you know, the pain will make you remember, right? Now, of course, you know, um, this is not actually the experiment. That was just a setup. Right. The actual people, you know, who are the subjects, it's not blogs, he's an actor, he's pretending to be shocked. Right. It's really the people determining whether they push uh -huh. the dial and increase it, because each time you shock him, you increase the strength or the yeah. voltage, uh -huh. and it becomes very painful. Mm. And, and, and at times, you know, blogs will start to scream, my heart, my heart, I have a heart, you know, and, he, and at times he's silent uh -huh. and he doesn't, re, you know, respond to your questions and you go, well, should I shock him? And there's a person next to you, the scientist, he says, no, I'm in charge, don't worry, this is what you need to do, keep doing this, this is for the sake of the experiment, you got to keep mm -hmm. going. So we're really testing the susceptibility of the average person right. to obedience, you know, yeah. to, to authority, right? Yes. Like, how likely are we to obey morally questionable, morally reprehensible right. commands? Especially if it's done by someone with, you know, like, I don't know, white lab coat and like a nice Yale authority ID. Figure. Authority figures, exactly, right? Or how much the fear this person generally have towards, uh, I, I don't know. The, to the authority figure? Yeah. Well, it wasn't really like they were no. afraid of the authority okay. figure, you know. It wasn't like if they didn't do it, they would fail their grade, you know, they get failed or right. anything like that. But it was okay. more like you sign up for this experiment. This is what mm -hmm. you have to do. Okay. Why don't you do it? Right. Okay. So uh, uh, perc percentage-wise, how many percentage of the subjects do you think flipped the switch all the way? Uh, um, I don't know, depending on how educated they are or how students. moral yeah, like they are or ethical. Oh, students? Yes. Uh, You're like, oh, students, forget it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would say more than 50, perhaps. Is that right? 65%. Oh, wow. So in some cases, they continue to electrocute the wow. uh, mm. subject even when he stopped responding. Wow. And, you know, Milgram was so astonished, astounded, impressed, horrified mm -hmm. by the results of this experiment. He said, I don't really need to go to Germany to test it. I can see how it happens in this country. Uh -huh. And you know, um, and I think that's kind of what's happening in this case as well. I mean, the experiment is really testing the responses of the, of the students in this experiment. The mice aren't actually shocked, right? right? But the idea is that, you know, you have 20 seconds to press the button, the computer records how long it takes you to press the button or whether or not you press the button. And they found that like five six, five six of the subjects who were in this scenario did press the button and they chose to divert the electric shock to the one mouse, sparing the five mice, right? Mm. But it was only in their intervention that that was able to happen. Okay. And so regardless of how they, they answered on the hypothetical scenarios. Mm. So even if they answered the hypothetical scenarios that they wouldn't kill or, you know, the one person, Right. They did that for the mouse. They would push the button for the mouse. Okay. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's difficult though at times then because then this seems to show that our sort of hypothetical responses to these, you know, thought experiments don't mm -hmm. actually show us how we actually would act in the real world, it seems. That's one takeaway that people sometimes would get from an experiment like this. Right. And it's not clear that we have enough, you know, evidence for, to make a stronger claim like that. Right. You know, yeah. but, but at the very least, we found that, you know, like uh, Boston found that the people who did indicate that they were willing to pull the switch or push the person off the footbridge were comfortable, were reacted, responded more quickly in pushing the button mm -hmm. to electrocute the one mouse, and they were more comfortable with the decision afterwards, right? Now, of course, they were told at the end, you didn't, no, no, no mice were harmed right. in see. this thought experiment. I see, okay. But again, it's a really interesting sort of instance of these sort of like um, trolley car experiences, you know, but it does raise, you know, uh, sort of a general question we might have on, you know, well, then what, what is the value of doing these sort of thought experiments? And I think we've talked a lot about the importance of expanding your moral imagination. Mm. 
And just thinking about trying to understand what's going on, you know, what's going on in our minds when we read these narratives and try to make these moral judgments. Mm. And even if they don't have um, the sort of real world application that we would want, even if mm. there's not a sort of 100% correspondence between how they select on a hypothetical and what they actually do in the world, right. I think it's important, you know, to see how people, you know, think we should ideally ought to act or how they'd like to act, regardless mm. of whether they actually act that way or not. And I think that, you know, um, this, this also actually might predict, and some, some psychologists suggest that it actually does predict our actual level of comfort or discomfort, I should say, with these kinds of scenarios in general. Oh, totally. But again, I, I think it's helpful for us to, to, to use these thought experiments to sort of hone in on and refine our sort of moral intuitions at stake in these cases. Because maybe some of those moral intuitions are flawed and we may have to jettison them. Mm -hmm. Maybe we weren't quite clear about the distinction initially between letting die and killing. Mm -hmm. So these are sort of distinctions that I, I think are pretty important to make, you know. Now I'm not saying, you know, unequivocally there's a clear conceptual distinction between letting die and killing. Because right. a lot of philosophers question that as well. Mm -hmm. And so but at the very least we're aware of the distinction yeah. so that we can then question. That's a whole it. other issue there. A whole other issue, right? It's just it's the conversation keeps growing and proliferating. Yep. Mm -hmm. So to, to, to sum up <laughs> the last part of the title, you know, well, what does this have to do with the world we live in today? And mm -hmm. I think it has a lot to do with the world we live in today. Totally. Because, of course, we live in a world of crisis. We mm -hmm. live in a world that is suffering from a pandemic that yes. is reaching every country. Yeah. It doesn't matter what how rich your country is or not. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether you live in the global south or live in the global north. Right. Every country, rich and poor, is being affected by this. Uh -huh. And almost every person in every level of society stands to risk of being infected. And what we've seen in the past few years is precisely these trolley-like hypothetical experiments are coming into life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes some of the most terrifying ways, the sort of kill one to save five scenarios yep. where we have to deal with scarcity and issues yeah. of like, what do we do? Do we, you know, um, you know, if you only have one bed left in your ICU, who do right. you admit? You know, a mm -hmm. person who has a better chance of resisting COVID, yeah. a person who is more susceptible to COVID. Either right. way, you might mm -hmm. be choosing someone who dies. We don't have enough ventilators. Initially, we didn't have enough masks and mm -hmm. 95 masks. So on top of all the hard work doctors and nurses have, they, they, they should have gone through those, uh, hopefully taken your ph philosophy <laughs> courses and gone through some moral, ethical <laughs> trainings or pro self-provoking, uh, you know, uh, programs for them to make the, the best decision on the spot. Right? Ideally, but again, we see the lag between even dealing with these hypotheticals, you and I talking about them, there's still a sort of level of real world <laughs> mm -hmm. significance that yeah. unfortunately they have to encounter. But I think it's important. I think you're right to at least to be able to expand our moral imagination yeah. and to consider these moral intuitions and mm -hmm. to consider how we reflect about them and how that affects us is probably, you know, is right. ex extremely important today. Yeah, these are very important thoughts that we, I, I feel we should have be, because we all are social animals and this is a, the pandemic makes us actually actually grow together and live together even more right. closely. So this is uh, affecting each other so intimately in every single way of we life. We live in an increasingly connected society, both on a fundamental economic level mm -hmm. as well as in the internet. We have an exchange of philosophies, religions, and ideologies. Psychology. And we have now a psychologies. Yes. We now discover that, you know, I can get my coffee from Guatemala. Mm. I can get my, um, I don't know, passion fruit from, you know, uh, perhaps the Indonesia, right? right? And I can get my cheese from Vermont, right? That is, we, you know, we're so interconnected economically yes. that we all live together on this one planet. Yes. And our actions here affect our act mm -hmm. uh, other people's lives everywhere else. And just as we're all interconnected together and we all live together, we all die together too. Yes. And so these questions of life and death affect all of us. Yeah, it really uh, draws us uh, closer and think about we live as a whole, as a society, as a country, as a, on the earth, as a globe. And really it is a, a big 
deal to learn to live together ethically and morally. Right. I, I mean, just to sort of sum up this idea, you know, um, I feel like, uh, and Peter Singer talks about this idea that, you know, you know, over, you know, in the history of the world, we started maybe progressing from my moral circle, mm -hmm. which was just me and my family. And then we expanded to the people in our community mm. and we've expanded beyond our community to, you know, to recognize all human beings. So right. we're no longer, you know, some people who are just the aristocrats or the elite and everyone mm. else. We mm -hmm. decide that, you know, no, the poor and the plebs are also have rights. And then we start to realize that, you know, it's wrong to keep slaves, right? They're human beings as well. And now our moral circle is expanding and yes. we have to ask the much tougher questions. Are non-human animals also moral persons entitled to moral consideration? And do we have moral obligations to the globe that we live on? Totally. So that we're no longer just one community, one mm -hmm. city, one country, but we're one world. How do we begin to act and think about that? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Burke. I re really enjoyed the conversation. I've learned so much today. Uh, thank you very much and uh, appreciate your presence here. And uh, thank you for coming to Tsuji Cafe to tonight. Well, thank you so much and thank you for having me here. I really do admire and appreciate everything that you do in spreading the values of mindfulness and thoughtful contemplation. I think um, in this sort of fast paced world where we seem to fire off tweets faster than we think, I think it's important to stop and reflect on where we are in this world and how we actually are treating each other. And I'm really glad to be here and thank you again. Great. And thank you for having me. Thank you. That's a great take home message for us, all of us. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank okay, you, Dr. Thank you. Burke.